بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. We are honored to tonight to have uh, Sheikh Dr. Hatim, and I feel like we don't need to introduce him, but uh, we had a speaker who told us it's a good habit to introduce your guests. Alhamdulillah, it's a, it's a blessing. I used to drive 45 minutes to listen to Sheikh Hatim, so now he's here. So, mashallah, this is a blessing. Dr. Hatim is, uh, has a PhD in comparative fiqh. He, mashallah, has a master degree in Sharia law, and he's the dean of uh, Islamic Studies College in Mishka University. He's a member of the permanent uh, fatwa committee in the country. Without further ado, I'll give it to Sheikh Dr. Hatim. Jazakumullah khair for attending. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salam wa rasulullah wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa man wa ala thamma amma ba to proceed. So today's talk will be about confusion. Uh, not to cause confusion, but to address the, the problem of confusion. Uh, inshallah, we will not add to it. I hope so. Uh, so the, the, the flyer, I, you know, uh, I saw the flyer just like everybody else did. And on the flyer it says, uh, I'm confused. Uh, which teachings to follow uh, for Mazahib, parents, Sheikh Google, Google uh, XYZ Institute, uh, what, sh what should we follow? And in order for us to address this a little bit more systematically, uh, let's just go from uh, the beginning and uh, address, these are epistemological issues. These are issues related to the theory of epistemology or nazariyat uh, al-ma'rifah. It's about knowledge, it's about how do, you, how do we know uh, that our knowledge is true or that which we know is uh, true. And how do we use it also? Uh, how do, you, do we use our knowledge in a proper uh, manner to make informed decision and to lead productive good lives that will earn us happiness in this life and the one to come. So you are confused. Are you? Like, <laughs> because sometimes like you're, you're maybe speaking to the wrong audience. Uh, so it seems that that's, that's usually our problem. The problem is the people who come to attend those classes or these classes are usually not the people who are confused. Uh, so you're, you're speaking to the wrong crowd. But we will presume that you guys are confused. And we will presume also that you're extremely confused. Uh, so many people, like if you're extremely confused, let's say that the the prototype here, uh, is a, a, like a Muslim youth who grew up here, uh, and because you know the flyers said parents and so on, it's I think presumed that his parents are Muslim, uh, and he's trying to figure out his way through culture like sort of parents, madhahib, different groups at the masjid, different groups at college, Muslims, non-Muslims, different philosophies that he may be exposed to, and honestly also different theistic traditions, different religions. So many people will tell you, follow this group or follow that group, follow this sheikh or follow that sheikh. And they would, these are sincere people, keep, keep in mind. that These are not people, most of the time, these are not people who are trying to scam you or anything. These are really good people that care about you and want the best for you. And since they think that they are guided, they want you to be guided as well. So they think that if you come with them to their sheikh, uh, that you will basically... Um, 
come out of this confusion and find certainty, the certainty they had, and you find that coolness of certainty. So what else could they wish for you that's better than this? The coolness of certainty. So these are good people that are trying to help you. But the thing is, that would be begging the question. Because if you're confused, you don't know what's right and what's wrong. And just the, the, the very simple fact that they trust their sheikh does not necessarily mean, or they trust XYZ group or XYZ institute does not necessarily mean that it is trustworthy. Uh, and, and I don't want you to be too sort of skeptical about everything because that ends, you know, in a very bad place where you become cynical and cynicism is certainly disastrous. And I don't want you to give up your certainty just to look to appear intelligent because some people do that. And those are the people who may get lost and never come back. Uh, just to, to appear different, to appear unique, to appear uh, unlike everybody else. So you try to uh, go against the, the crowd and the, the currents and just be uh, different. And that may entail complete departure from Islam, to be honest, for some people. Because like, you want to be really different. You want, you know, from the surrounding, uh, your surrounding environment and your cultural milieu. Uh, and, and that leads people uh, completely away from Islam. So if you are serious and you really want to be guided, and that is the expectation that you, you are serious and you really want uh, to be guided, then uh, don't uh, just be, be, be as sincere as you can, because this is a very serious matter. Because if you get misguided, you may never be able to come back. Sometimes if you take the wrong route, you may never be able to come back. So this is a very serious matter that would require like three things that are extremely important. And there are three different verses uh, that we can quote here. One of, the, one of them is Fear Allah and Allah will teach you. Be conscious of God and God will teach you. Taqullah. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, and Allah will teach you. Allah will guide you. And Allah is all-knowing of all things. This ayah tells us that you have to be conscious of God, we're saying that, we're presuming that you're extremely, extremely confused, and we're even presuming, presuming that you are not certain about anything. Uh, you're, you may not be that person. We're just presuming, because if you're not that person, then we're, we're just starting the discussion a few steps uh, earlier and if you're not that person, don't worry. You don't have to be that person. Uh, and you don't need to go back to be that person and move forward. If you're already here, if you have more certainty, and if you're already comfortable with your deen, it's your, if you're already comfortable with this Quran being the final message, the, the final communication from the divine to the final messenger, I, that's, that is great and that's where we want to, to be. Um, so you don't have to step back so that you can move forward. You're, you're good here and keep, keep moving. But again, at the same time, try to build more certainty here because you will need the certainty later when you come across difficulties, when you come across misconceptions, when you come across disputations between Muslims. Uh, you will need to go back and find your rock, your, your, your anchorage, your zone that your fortress you know this is what I know for certain to be certain and I am comfortable here and then I'll proceed cautiously and I'll try to man to sort of figure out my way uh, through all of these 
differences and all of these disputations and all of these arguments, like Muslims could really like uh, be calling each other names over issues that are like part of orthodoxy, not part of our heritage, but part of our orthodoxy. Like, remember when this uh, Supreme Court case about abortion, the Supreme Court uh, uh, decision about uh, abortion, the, the recent one, and all of the arguments that arose from that decision between Muslims. Uh, so when you're not certain about what makes a person Muslim, and then you fight over basically ideology, you turn Islam into ideology and you fight over positions that are adopted by our greatest imams. So Malikis, for instance, uh, consider, you know, consider uh, contraception, like consider the expulsion of uh, semen fr fr from, from the vagina. They consider this to be haram. That is haram to them. Uh, so basically some Muslim can go as far as believing that all of this is, is haram uh, because he truly believes in that Maliki position. Is he entitled to it? Yes. I mean, if you're Maliki or if that's the position that you believe in, even if you're not Maliki, but that's the position that you believe in, that's fine. And, and certainly, they would hate for someone to say that most Hanafis and Shafi'is don't believe in that, that the, most Hanafis and Shafi'is, or the authorized position in the Hanafi, hmm? Still, okay. But so some people are unable to hear me in the back? You're unable to hear me in the back? Okay. So if <clears throat> so if you're if you're Hanafi and Shafi'i, many Hanafis and Shafi'is would consider the authorized position. There are sort of differences within the madhahab. So you go back to your sheikh. Your sheikh tells you, "No, that's not true. Come back to me, and I'll show it to you." So mo many Hanafis and Shafi'is would consider abortion to be permissible. You know, and it depends on like the, the, the verbiage they use. Some will consider it permissible for a good reason, mutual consultation, mutual agreement between the husband and wife. And certainly you would presume that there is like some good reason to allow abortion, but they would consider this to be permissible up to 120 days, up to 120 days. And the Hanbaris come in the middle, 40 days for the Hanbaris. 40 days for the Hanbaris is the cutoff. So for the Malikis, zero. For the Han Hanbaris, 40. And for, the, for many Hanafis and Shafi'is, certainly that would not, like we were saying many Hanafis and Shafi'is. Uh, Imam al-Ghazali, for instance, would not uh, allow abortion at all. He's Shafi'i. Am, am I more Shafi'i than Imam al-Ghazali? No. But again, at the same time, the, 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 these madhahib are huge and there are many scholars and there is a process basically for them to decide what, what is the authorized position and that could also be different between you know, the different generations within the madhahib. But at least we can say that a sizable portion of these scholars had argued that it would be allowable all the way up to 120 days. So who's Muslim here? Who's Muslim? The Hanafi and Shafi'i that, that is allowing this up to 120 days or the Maliki that's not allowing this at all? Which one of them is Muslim? All of them are Muslim. Therefore, that whole discussion does not, has nothing to do with whether you're Muslim or not. And when, when you don't know what makes a person Muslim, what constitutes being Muslim, then that whole discussion can turn into one uh, uh, that leads to heretication and excommunication and, and name calling and, and all, all of these things. Because we're just like, we're trying to learn Islam from uh, Facebook posts and from Twitter, Twitter and <laughs> from these places. So you figure that 
this is what Islam is. This is Islam. Islam, you know, is completely against abortion. Islam, you know, has this much room, you know. Uh, and then if you have leanings also, if you have political leanings or cultural leanings, they will influence what you accept to be Islam and, and, and so on. And then, like, one day I was uh, at a conference and one of the mashayikh said that these people, these, uh, you know, kuffar, uh, they have najasa in their underwear. Okay, why? Because they don't use water <laughs> to clean themselves. Well, but, I mean, that's not the, the proper way to talk about these issues. Uh, particularly that there were non-Muslims in the crowd that came to learn about Islam. Perhaps they <laughs> would be attracted to it. Uh, so, but forget about that. <laughs> Imam Malik considered this to be, you know, considered washing to be something women do. That's the people of Medina, the people of Medina that Imam Malik was reporting from. And that is within one century from, you know, the departure of our Prophet wasallam. He was considering this to be what women do. Men don't do this. To, to tell you that it was really not that common. And, but forget about the Maliki position, even according to the others, it is completely fine to use tissue or, you know, to use rocks or anything, you know, that uh, could have been used. So that, is, that does not define Islam. It, it seems that this is for us defining, this is defining Islam for us. Like if you use water to clean yourself, you're Muslim, and if you're not, then it's, you know, it's doubtful. I don't know what to think about you. And people, people actually had the, these arguments. The people, people actually who walk, like who worked in certain companies, uh, they would suspect, like if you don't go into the, <laughs> if you don't take a bottle of water with you and then throw it in, in, in the restroom somewhere next to the, Anyway, but, but if you don't do this, people would suspect that he's not really practicing. This guy is like a little bit, you know, yeah, that's fine. He says he's Muslim, but that's fine. Uh, that's, that, that's just utterly crazy because, you know, so people, people don't know what Islam is about, what makes a person Muslim, and then you read different things, you watch different videos on YouTube, you read different posts, and you get confused. And, and certainly that's, that's a huge confusion. Therefore, you just need to, to step back and figure out how to build your own faith. How to build your own faith, build it. How to make your own fortress. You know, having certainty in your faith is the sweetest and the greatest you know, and the most assuring feeling you could ever have. So, let's go back. If, if you believe, you know, what are, what are the options there? What are the options there? Uh, and I'm telling you, be, be, be conscious of God and God will teach you and God is all knowing. Even if you're, if, you're, if you're uncertain about all things, if you're starting from scratch, you either believe in an all good deity or not. Because the other option is believing in an evil deity. And, and I hope that we can exclude this from the discussion. So all good deity or, not, or nothing. If, if there is nothing, then you, you don't lose anything by being good, right? You will not lose anything by being good. In fact, if, you, if you're good, it, you know, st studies have shown that you would actually fare better than someone who, uh, if, if you're good and you believe in some deity that rewards for goodness, 
you'll fare better than someone who doesn't. But, but these are the options that we have, an all good deity, deity or not. If it is an all good deity, wouldn't you want his help and assistance in your pursuit of guidance? Wouldn't it be he, wouldn't he be the most capable being of guiding you to him? He's the all capable and all good and compassionate deity. I think we should agree that he would be the, the one most capable of guiding you. So you would be interested in pleasing him. You would be interested in drawing closer to him. So being good, being conscious of God is important, is extremely important in your pursuit of, of God. The second ayah that I want to quote here, in addition to attaqullah wa yu'allimukullah, Allah bi kulli shayna alim, is the last ayah of Surah Al-Ankabut. وَالَّذِينَ جَهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُوا لَنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ and those who strive for our cause, we shall guide them to our paths. And Allah is with the good doers. And Allah is with the good doers. And why did I mention this? Although it looks, it seems like the other ayah, the same theme, same concept. But because it says, وَالَّذِينَ جَهَدُوا فِينَا Strive. So they're, they're, the investment is worth it. To answer the existential questions, where did we come from? What are we here for? Where are we going? These are important questions to answer. And your investment in answering those questions and having certain answers, answers to those questions and being completely confident in your answers to those questions, there is no investment that's too big for attaining the right answers to those questions, those existential questions. So strive for, his, for him, strive for his cause. And if you do and you put the effort and you have the determination to, to attain this guidance, he will grant it to you. The other verse uh, is sirat al mustaqim familiar, right? Sirat al Mustaqim, guide us to the straight path. So, why is this verse important? Because it's a direct uh, supplication, appeal, petition to Allah to guide you. So, you're, you, you're being God conscious, you're trying to do all the good things, you're being truthful, you're being kind, you're being prayful, you're being uh, dutiful to your parents, you're being honest, all of these things. You're trying to be God conscious, you're being all of these things. You're putting a lot of investment and a lot of effort into the pursuit of guidance. And it is also important that you directly seek his assistance by asking him for guidance. And that you do this repeatedly. We do this 17 times a day, right? we ought to do this at least 17 times a day. So that's, that's why this is important. And it is important also for all of us to be reminded that this idea of I'm, I'm confused is in part uh, fabricated, fabricated. Because most of the teachings of Islam are not controversial. And there should be no confusion about them. Yes, they, they talk a lot about where you place your hands below your navel, above your navels, next to your sort of legs uh, or thighs, or where do you place your hands? Did they ever disagree over praying on time? <laughs> no, they didn't. Are you praying on time? Forget about your hands. Just put your hands wherever you want. But are you praying on time? Are you praying the five daily prayers? You know, have they ever disagreed over the four rakahs of dhuhr? No, but are you doing any of that? That is important. Don't say I am confused. They keep on arguing about, you know, the hands and this and that and the size of the beard. 
but are you doing that which is completely clear and completely non-controversial? Once you have done that, you have the right to say, they're confusing me. They're, they're just, they keep on arguing about like city stuff. You know, so this is important. Uh, so waste no time arguing what a good man should be. Be one. Who said that? Marcus, Aure Marcus Aurelius. He was an emperor. He was a Roman emperor and a philosopher. So it's a common wisdom. It is a common wisdom. It's not something that I'm telling you because of my theistic background or my Islamic background. It is a common wisdom. Most of the people who waste time arguing about what goodness is are not really interested in goodness because there is so much goodness out there that you could do without arguing. So waste no more time arguing what a, should, what a good man should be. Be one. Marx Aurelius. Okay. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, you know, and we said that we say in the Nasrat al-Mustaqim so many times every day. But the Prophet ﷺ also had a dua that is so beautiful, and it is, it's just about this. Uh, Muslim reported from Aisha radiallahu anha that when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, started the night prayers, he would make this dua. Allahumma rabba Jibra'il wa Mika'il wa Israfil Fatir al-Samawati wal-Ard, Alim al-Ghaybi wa shahada أنت تحكم بين عبادك فيما كانوا فيه يختلفون اهدني لما اختلف فيه من الحق بإذنك فإنك تهدي من تشاء إلى صراط المستقيم So, O oh Allah, Lord of Jibra'il and Mika'il and Israfil, knower of the seen and the unseen, or uh, creator of the heavens and the earth, knower of the seen and the unseen, you judge between your servants in that over which they have disputed, guide me to the truth by your permission about that which they dispute over. Uh, for you guide whomever you please to a straight path. It's, it's, it is, it's a beautiful dua. And if, if you say this dua, uh, and while being conscious of God and trying to be good, uh, and being determined and investing the, the effort that is due to this, to these um, questions, to, to, to attaining the right answer to these questions, Allah will not let you down. Why would He let you down? What would Allah do tormenting you if you are grateful and faithful? Why? Why would he? So now, <clears throat> the tools that we have in our journey, we want guidance, we want to clear the confusion. The tools that we have in our journey are all given to us in Surah Al-Nahl. That's uh, Surah number 16, verse 60. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in these two verses, وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا أَمْرُ السَّاعَةِ إِلَّا كَلَمْحِ الْبَصَرِ أَوْ هُوَ أَقْرَبُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So وَلِلَّهِ غَيْبُ السَّاعَةِ This is the theory of epistemology here. This is, so what is it that you need? What are the tools? How do I basically attain guidance? I need to figure out how to do this. Um, and what tools have I been given to in, that will help me in this pursuit, in this endeavor? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you, you know that there, 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 this has been a question that philosophers have been busy answering for ages. And it culminated into you know, the division between the British empiricists and the continental innatists you know, the people who say that we come out with the tabula rasa, that's like an Avicennan 
term meaning blank slate. If we come out knowing nothing, blank slate, and we basically inscribe on that blank slate through our empirical experiences of the world, through our senses and empirical experiences of the world. And then the innatists, these are people like who follow Socrates, and they believed that we come in with knowledge that is all programmed into the hardware. The, the software is there, but it just needs to be sort of brought out. That's why Socrates felt that he's, uh, um, he's, his job is like a midwife, to bring out that which is buried in there, uh, inside you. And the continental innatists, they, they believed in that. So the Quran, you know, and these people, people sometimes like to create those dichotomies and fight over them. And people who want the truth, they don't block off any sensible argument. Mm, so they sometimes come up with synthesis that may look a little bit bland. Because like, so, so where is the fight now? Like how, that would end the fight if we go by these verses. How are we gonna continue the fight? Because it's, it just brings in everything together. Because it's, what, what does it say? Well, well, these verses, and to Allah belongs the unseen, which means the knowledge, all the knowledge of the unseen. You have no access to this. That is why Kant talked about the futility of metaphysics, and he didn't like you know, that branch of philosophy, metaphysics. How could, you, how could you speculate about things that are completely beyond your experience? That just doesn't make sense. You know, in, in the uh, critique of pure reason, Kant talked about this. Uh, so Allah is saying that, that, is, that knowledge is with me. You know, don't look for it elsewhere. You know, it, it is with me. To Allah belongs the uh, unseen. And the command of the hour is none but uh, like the glance of an eye or even closer. In Allah, Allah is capable over all things. Then, what about the knowledge that we can acquire? We know that this knowledge is yours, O oh God. The knowledge of the unseen is yours. What about the knowledge that we can acquire? And he says, and Allah brought you out from the wombs or extracted you from the wombs of your mothers, brought you out from the wombs of your mothers. La ta'lamuna shay'an, knowing nothing. So someone may say, well, here, tabiola raza, empiricist, but wait. And, but, so, so he said, وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَ And he gave you sama hearing. That's called what? Truthful reports. Well, uh, absar vision, that is a reference to the senses, the empirical senses. Well, afida. What are al afida? Al afida is more complicated than just intellect. Intellect and instinct. Intellect and instinct. Both would be the al afida the internal so, so potency. And, and, and the, in Islam and our scholars talked about this. This is not, these are like molds. This is not like data that come in the form of like bites. No, these are molds. So whatever it is that you gain, the knowledge that you gain through your experiences, your brain has those molds and it fits the knowledge into them. So the brain has a potency, not ready knowledge, but potency. And there are four different important laws that apply to all things. One of them is called the law of identity. The other one is called the law of non-contradiction. The third one is called the law of excluded middle. And the fourth one is called the law of sufficient cause. These are laws that that apply to everything. If, like many atheists nowadays, you reject one of those laws, that leads to complete chaos. That leads to basically compromising the, uh, 
the intellect, the, 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 your, your ability, your, the, your mind's ability to reason. So anyway, but these are potencies. So Allah told us in this verse that you could have knowledge, true knowledge, through truthful reports. How do we know that the reports are truthful? How do you know? Why did Allah start with some uh, truthful reports? Most of the knowledge that you have comes through truthful reports. Don't fool yourself and think that you figured out electricity by your empirical experience. No, you have not. You don't think, like, do you know what, what are the protons and electrons and nucleus and what is DNA and all of this? You heard about all of this. What did Einstein know about biology through empirical experience, through his own experience? Almost nothing. You know, he was a physicist, not a biologist. So, and what did he know about paleontology? What did he know about all the other fields? Uh, most of what we know comes to us through truthful reports. And most of the time, it's not certain knowledge. But we decide to accept it because it's close to certain. It's pretty, it's good enough. It's good enough, but it's not certain knowledge. But how could you be certain that what you're hearing is true? Two ways. One of them is concurrence. Concurrence is tawatur. So how did people, how did people know forever, for ages, how did they always know that China exists. Concurrence. They haven't seen it. You know, people in Egypt like uh, 600 years ago, how did they know that China existed? They haven't seen it. They haven't heard it. They haven't touched it. They haven't smelled it. They haven't tasted it. They heard from many people that China exists. From many pe people that are too many to conspire. Uh, or to collude uh, on a lie. Too many, you know, I'm coming from two different, okay. So that's concurrence. The Quran reached us through concurrence. And that is why we have that comfort, that confidence, that certainty, that this book, not only that we have the confidence and the certainty that we should have developed and we should have like, you know, been extremely, extremely comfortable with that Allah sent the, a message to his final messenger. But we also have the certainty that this message reached us through certain transmission. What, what is the other way that you could uh, verify the certainty of the report. Miracles. A miracle. So the people who saw the people who saw uh, Prophet Musa alayhi salam split the Red Sea. Shouldn't that have been enough for them to believe that the Torah uh, has come from God? I wouldn't blame you if you say no. And if we were to open a gate for them into the heavens and they continue to ascend, they may say that we were deluded. We were intoxicated. But... The reason why this miracle confers certainty is because of the message that he came with. The message that he came with is a message that would come from God. It is a message that, that tells you about your purpose, that tells you about your creator, it tells you, and it, it, it gives you a solid worldview supported by the miracle. And so why, when, when it came to Islam, 
So th these are the two come, come hand, you know, hand and glove. They come together. So the, the veracity and the truth of the message and the supporting miracle. Why when it came to Islam, the Prophet had so many physical miracles or supernatural events. Let's, let's call them supernatural events because they were mainly in Medina. They were mainly a karama, you know, uh, to, to uh, increase and strengthen the faith of the believers, not in response to challenges, but as a gift from God to strengthen the faith of the believers. So because the message of the Prophet was, were meant, was meant to be the final message, the emphasis was in the, on the message more than the miracles. The message, the miraculousness of the message, the legislative miracle of the Quran, this Cambrian explosion of a value system out of nothing. You know the Cambrian explosion in biology? Those of you who know biology or paleontology, you know, the, the fossil record is like empty, empty, like, and all of a sudden, not completely empty, but all of a sudden you see an explosion of variety of different types of life. An explosion, a sudden explosion. That's the Cambrian explosion in the fossil record. There was a Cambrian explosion of values, teachings, wisdoms in Arabia, in the, you know, uh, end of the sixth century, beginning of the seventh century of the common era. That's the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that, along with the miracles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, confers certainty. So the Sahaba have this certainty. And we should have this the certainty as well because we've received the Quran through concurrence. So that is Sama. And then Allah said empirical senses, empirical senses. And that's why we as Muslims should be, should have a greater claim to the, and, and, and certainly Francis Bacon and Roger Bacon and everybody that they had clearly indicated that the experimental method have come, has come to them from Muslim scientists. So we should have a greater claim to the scientific method and we should be more scientific as a people than we are. We tend to be less scientific. We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to, 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 we have to reform our minds so that whatever it is that we feed our minds with is good, good stuff. You know, we have to go by this verse how do you know that what you know is right? Just make sure that it is coming from right sources and it is coming through right channels. Uh, is this a report? Is, the, 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 is this your empirical experience? No, it's not. It's a report. Is this certain? Does it have a certain implication? Did it come through certain transmission? And, and so on. And then Use your mind correctly. Use that potency that Allah gave you correctly. These are extremely important tools. Extremely important tools. But we said that Af'idah is not only about the intellect, it's also about the instinct. And if you ignore your instinct, you're basically dooming yourself. Because the intellect sometimes may not be sufficient. Instinct, the internal sense, al hiss al batin is extremely important. Can you imagine the bees giving up their instincts? The ants giving up their instincts? Do you know how much? Do you know how much? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He created and He apportioned us and He apportioned His creations and He guided them. Do you know how birds travel, you know, from like thousands of miles and come back? What is this, intellect? No, instinct. You know, do you know how ants work and how they divide the work among themselves? Just read about ants. Just read about ants. Read about bees. That's it. And you will understand the value of the instinct. 
that God gave you. And if you doubt that, why don't you doubt your mind as well? Why don't you doubt your senses as well? So make sure that the combination, the combination of the intellect and the instinct is the genuine disposition. It's the natural inclination. It is what Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in, you know, put a lot of trust in, the fitra. The, they would call him the fitra philosopher. And Henry Laos was completely impressed by him because of his emphasis on al-fitra. It is extremely important that you hold on to your instinct that Allah had given you, al hiss al in that internal sense that Allah had given you and not give it up. But again, at the same time, at the same time, he who was, who, you know, had a lot of respect for the fitrah, know that the fitrah is corruptible. And there are seven things that he mentioned that corrupt our fitrah. What are they, quickly, because you have to watch out for them in your pursuit of guidance, in your journey, you have to watch out for those seven, basically, fitra destroyers. They are, they are al-hawa, bias, wal-gharad, ulterior motives. Al-khars, conjecture, was shubha misconception. Al-ada, habit, Taqlid, blind following. al mawruth inherited beliefs. Inherited beliefs. All of these seven things attack your fitrah. Attack your fitrah. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, كل مولود يولد على فطرة فأبواه يهوداني هاو يمجساني أو ينصراني هاو يمجساني So every, uh, every newborn will be uh, born in a state of fitrah, genuine disposition and natural inclination, and it is his parents who will turn him into Jew, Christian, or Zoroastrian. Uh, so that is basically al-mawruth, the inherited uh, beliefs. So you watch out for ulterior motives, you watch out for uh, bias, you watch out for conjecture, you watch out for misconceptions, you watch out for habit, your habits could destroy your fitra. You watch out for blind following. You watch out for mawruth. How do you, how do you rehabilitate your fitra if it has been destroyed by riyada? Riyada is spiritual riyada, spiritual training. It's spiritual refinement. So it is immersion in the, the knowledge of al wah with uh, worship and spiritual uh, training consistently. Most importantly, most importantly, to be in the presence of God and to bring on the presence of God, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ibn Ata'a is secondary uh, he has a beautiful statement where he says, never abandon zikr or remembrance because you don't feel the presence, your presence with, with God. Because forgetfulness in remembrance is better than forgetfulness without remembrance. And perhaps he will elevate you from remembrance with heedlessness to remembrance with wakefulness awareness, and then from awareness to the divine presence, and from the divine presence to absence, your absence, the absence basically of al mushahadat everything but the divine, in your shahood, not in existence, but in your shahood, in your perception, that you have now basically cleared your vision completely, and you have a complete focus on the divine. And you keep this with you all the time. And that is the best rehabilitation of fitra, to, to be in a state of remembrance all the time. OK, now you're ready to build your fortress. <laughs> know that Islam is very 
very simple and straightforward. And that's why it is the most solid worldview, the most, because it's the simplest. That is Islam. That is Islam. They, they are the same. So when a man came to the Prophet وسلم, and said to him, you know, teach me something that I will ask no one about after you, what did he say to him? Say, I believe in Allah and then be upright. Say, I believe in Allah and then be upright. And that's it. Go back home and just try to do this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Kahf, so verily those who believed and uh, did righteousness or deeds of righteousness, theirs will be uh, the gardens of paradise as an abode, a final abode uh, to dwell in them for eternity, seeking or desiring no transfer no change, the ultimate bliss, bliss that you never get bored of, you never get sick of, you never seek ch any change or any transfer from it. And Iman is very simple. You're going to build here. And if you have any doubt, you figure that out now before you move on to something else and keep on building here. Three pillars of faith. We remember six, right? And some of us remember five. And Iman Billahi wa Malaikati wa Kutubi wa Rasuli wa Riyam al Akhir wa Al Qadr Khairi wa Sharri to believe in Allah and His angels and His books and messengers and the final day and predestination. Predestination is about the Qudra of Allah. It's about the power of Allah and His preceding knowledge. So now we come, it comes down to five. The three in the middle are about the message. So you have an angelic messenger that brought down a divine message to a human messenger. It's all about the message. It's about the nubuwat. It is about prophethood. So God, resurrection, and in the middle, prophethood. How to, he, you came from him, you're going back to him in, uh, you know, in the hereafter, and the roadmap or basically the blueprint of the way back it has been given to you through two messengers. And, oh, it's, oh, questions and answers. Okay, inshallah. What, what time is Aisha? Eight? Okay. Uh, so I, I'll wrap this up quickly, quickly. Um, and al-amal al-salih is pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. You have al-amal al-salih has two corners, two types, two conditions. We all know that, exterior and interior. The, the work of the interior and the work of the exterior. You have to have that balance between the exterior and the interior. And the conditions are ikhlas and mutaba'ah, and you have to have that balance between ikhlas and mutaba'ah. Don't be just of the people of ikhlas. Don't be just of the people of mutaba'ah. Be of the people of both, ikhlas and mutaba'ah. Ikhlas is sincerity, mutaba'ah is adherence to the sunnah. Ikhlas is devotion, mutaba'ah is correctness. Be of the people of both, and be of the people who beautify their interior and exterior. And certainly, al-amal al-salih is uh, towards the creator, that's ibadah, and the creation, that is mu'amala. Ibadat, mu'amalat, towards the creator, towards the creation. And most of this is not controversial. Most of this is not controversial. You know, don't gossip, don't backbite. You know, don't oppress people. Don't be obscene, don't be rude. Uh, pray on time, fast the month of Ramadan you know, be honest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is, is pretty easy. Now, uh, the bulk of this talk about the former Zahib, culture, parents, Sheikh Google, 
XYZ uh, Institute. I will leave it for the questions and answers. Mm -hmm. Yes. You said, "Kul kul aman tu billahi summa astaba." Yes. The iman of Allah is known. It's easy to say that we say "aman tu billah." Astaqim. The astaqama needs knowledge. How to astaqim? Okay. On what basis? <clears throat> so, so, so the question is: We know that iman billah is easy, but then um, in the Basically, we're referring to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he wanted to give the, the, the shortest advice possible to someone who did not want to ask anyone else about it. Uh, and he told him, say, I believe in Allah and then be upright. And the question is, we know, that we know what belief is, but how, do, how, do we, how can we be upright? And the Prophet ﷺ meant to say, certainly that does not mean that you don't learn what the knowledge that is necessary to, to establish your ibadah and all of that stuff. But the Prophet ﷺ wanted to say that no matter how much we lie to ourselves, when we're not upright, we know that we're not upright. You know, uh, and we just deceive ourselves. There is, so the Prophet is, is basically indicating by the short advice that there is an internal compass that you turned off. There is a GPS, an internal one, an instinctual one that God has given you, but you turned it off. Or you turn it off whenever you want to. And you turn it back on. You know, you come to the masjid, turn it on for a little while, go out, turn it off, and just carry on with your life so that you don't get bothered. So that's what the prophet meant, that you do it. You are the one who's turning off the internal compass, internal GPS. But certainly that does not mean that we don't learn to, to improve you know, our knowledge, our connection with God. To, to correct our worship. Knowledge is of great importance in Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, فَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِ عَلَى أَدْنَاكُمْ Or كَفَضْلُ الْقَمَرِ لَيْلَةِ الْبَدْرِ عَلَى سَعْرِ الْكَوَاكِبِ The virtue of the, uh, the scholar over the worshiper like, is like the virtue, uh, like my virtue over the least among you. Um, and, but certainly that, that's the scholar who's also a worshiper. Yes, next. Yeah. Uh, since Sahaba were not uh, Hanbali or Shafi'i or Malki or Hanafi, then what was good for them back then is good for us now. Is that a true statement? Especially that we have more access to authentic information than at the time of Sahaba through trusted internet sites. I mean the time after the Prophet's death. Okay, so this is <clears throat> good. So that we, we got into the, the meat of the, the discussion. So, the, so this is in reference to the four madhahib and the place of the four madhahib and why the four madhahib and all of that stuff. So the Sahaba, uh, and I, I have a position on the four madhahib that, that I believe to be a moderate one. I don't basically uh, geometrically adjust my positions to be in the middle, in the geometrical middle, because that doesn't make sense. Uh, but sometimes they just turn out to be somewhere in the geometrical or mathematical middle. But anyway, so the, 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 the Sahaba were able to, uh, to deduce, or at least the, the scholars among them, which were many, many, uh, we're able to deduce the rulings from the text of the revelation, whether it's Quran and Sunnah. But for, for later generations, uh, you, you see how this process can, get, can become messed up completely. Like if you allow people, if you allow the public to just examine the Quran and Sunnah by themselves, 
uh, you will come up with like two million madhahib. Uh, because people will, and, and, and you will come up with wild positions as well uh, that are completely baseless and that are completely in discord with the uh, text of Revelation uh, because th there is a process. Uh, the hermeneutical system of Islam is a very solid one and the, the masses don't necessarily have that much knowledge about, you know, the usul of interpretation, the usul of deduction. So we have a, a solid hermeneutical system and a scholar needs to have sort of a, a vast knowledge of the reports and a deep knowledge of the hermeneutical system, uh, the, the process of deduction. Therefore, uh, the madhahib are our greatest, you know, intellectual wonders. Uh, if we do away with them, that would be uh, basically suicidal. However, there are a couple of points here. One is the truth is not limited to the four madhahib. Sometimes there may be positions outside the four madhahib that are true and that are worth adopting. I'll give you one position, not because I'm biased, I may be biased, you know, I'm a human being, why, why not? We're all biased. So, but <laughs> yeah, you just can't not be biased. Uh, but th this like three divorces counting as one divorce, for instance, three divorces in one utterance counting as one divorce, this is not a position that this is not the position, uh, this is not the authorized position of any of the four madhahib. This is a position of Imam ibn Taymiyyah that has been accepted by uh, the legislatures in many Muslim countries where, you know, by legislatures that are not particularly sympathetic to Imam ibn Taymiyyah or they don't necessarily like him to begin with. But they, they basically cite him as the authority uh, in this uh, regard, why? Because there are certain conditions that need to be met to accept a position from outside of the form of Zahib. One of them is that the position has to be uh, upheld by a mujtahid, and he had his own adversaries, you know, acknowledging that he was a mujtahid. The second is, is that the position has to have has to be a substantial one that has some basis in the revelation. That position has basis in, in a hadith reported by Muslim, you know, from Abdullah ibn Abbas that three counted as one during the time of the Prophet and the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Um, and the position has to be one that has not been completely abandoned and has been mainstreamed by, you know, a group of Muslim scholars. And certainly with the legislatures in many Muslim countries accepting this, such as, you know, be, I, because I'm from Egypt, so I know in Egypt it, it is there, I know Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, these countries, I know that this position has been accepted in those countries by legislatures in those countries. So a position like this can be mainstreamed, can be mainstreamed. I will give you another example that may look a little bit even weaker, but I believe that it is a position that can be mainstreamed. I have always uh, advised pregnant and breastfeeding women who have, you know, uh, who miss Ramadan successively um, because of their pregnancy and breastfeeding and then they accumulate six or seven Ramadans where they couldn't fast because they were either breastfeeding or pregnant, I have always advised them that they may uh, just give the fidya and they don't have to make up for the, you know, for 400 days, you know, the, that they need to make up. Uh, well, this position is not authorized in any of the four madhahib. And being a Hanbali myself, that position is not a Hanbali position, you know, and certainly Hanbalis would frown at this position. 
But this position is from al Khilaf al Ali, that we say al Khilaf al Ali mean, meaning that it's reported from higher up, it's reported from Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar. And some contemporary scholars, like Sheikh uh, Sayyid Sabiq, Sheikh Yusuf al Qaradawi, Sheikh Nasr al Albani, Sheikh Atiyah Saqr, although Sheikh Atiyah Saqr you know, mentioned it as a possibility, did not necessarily support it, but the others supported it, and others. So these are scholars, and the idea that we now should have no mujtahideen and that it's the had ended, that's suicidal also, because it's it, like we are gonna act like we're without a brain. It's an ummah without a brain uh, that you know can basically address new issues and can make it the had and can provide guidance uh, for, for the people, despite the fact that there had been enormous changes, social changes uh, in, in the last 200 years. So to deprive the ummah of, of its brain and not allow, not allow it to address the enormous changes in the last 200 years in the world that we live in and the nature of the world that we live in would be suicidal and Sharia will become irrelevant, and we would have done it to ourselves. And then we could come back and cry and say, so why, you know, why is all of this happening? Why is nobody giving attention to, or, or caring about the Sharia or any of that stuff? So, the four madhahib are at the heart of our heritage. We go to them first, and then, there may be positions outside the form of have. We go through a process of mainstreaming those positions because we're not going to allow anybody who just simply has a PhD in fiqh to, to come up with positions and to start, start to spread them and, and so on and so forth. There has to be a process, collective ijtihad. And Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, rahimahullah, uh, did mention this that, this, that we need to invest more in collective ijtihad as a way out of the problem of uh, chaos or complete freezing. There, there has to be an answer in the middle. And I think that we have to have a process and uh, the, the process is acceptance, widespread acceptance of a position that is adopted by a mujtahid, whether from the past or the present. If there is widespread acceptance, uh, through the process of collective ijtihad, or even widespread acceptance without, you know, collective ijtihad, separate ijtihads that, you know, agreed on a position, then that position can be mainstreamed and can be considered a viable pos position. That's the, the that's the one contingency here with my emphasis, you know, like that doesn't detract from my emphasis on the importance and centrality of the four mazahib. The second contingency is that the four mazahib are meant, people who study fiqh are the people who should subscribe to the four mazahib. There is controversy between the scholars whether the masses, the public, the lay persons should subscribe to a mazhab or not, and the position that I believe in to be stronger wholeheartedly is that the masses should not subscribe to a madhab. Because if you ask someone, why do you subscribe to a madhab? And all he can say is, you know, that's, that's our madhab. Well, that's partisanship. That is basically fanaticism. Add a little bit of, you know, hot-bloodedness that we all have to this, and you create all the troubles in the world that we have witnessed and that we continue to witness. So, the public should not. By default, the public may be following a madhab because their scholar that they're referring to all the time in the, you know, happen to be uh, Shafi or Hanafi or Hanbali or Maliki. Well, that's fine. That's okay. But they should not subscribe to something they don't, they cannot defend their decision, you know, the, the, the decision of subscribing to it. They cannot defend it uh, with any like rational, they can't rationally defend it. So anyway, nowadays with the internet, it's a, it's a little bit different because it's not like, you know, people who live in upper Egypt 
are more Maliki and people who live in lower Egypt are more Shafi'i. You know, the world is not divided like this anymore because everybody goes online and everybody whatever follows whatever they are. So I have a lot of people studying Hanbali uh, stuff with me, you know, Hanbali law with me and they, they text me on WhatsApp and, you know, from Bangladesh and for, from uh, different parts of the world that Hanbalism has never been popular in. Should we be irritated by this? Should their parents be irritated by this? Why? Why don't you leave them? Why don't you respect their spiritual agency? Why don't you, you like, Al Imam ibn Hajar al Haytami, who's a very, very madhabi person, a very Shafi'i, very madhabi person, he said, when a father orders his son to follow his madhab, that is not binding on the son because if there is no purpose in that, it is utter foolishness. That's what he said. So this is, this is a, so we're not talking about a contemporary liberal this and that. We're just talking about your very, very classical, traditional scholar who's very madhabi. He said that if the father orders his son to follow his madhab and there is no purpose in this, like a good purpose, like a good purpose would be like what? Son, there, there are no hanbalis here. How are you going to do it? That's a good purpose. But if the son figured out a way to do it, then that's fine, you know. So when there is no good purpose, then it's other foolishness. Is that a good answer? Okay. Jazakallah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sheikh. I have a question, but before I ask the question, if anyone has a question and would like to post it on YouTube, I'm reading the questions from there as well. And the sisters, if, if you would like to uh, ask the questions on, on the YouTube, I'll take them from the live chat. So, Sheikh, uh, you explained very well, mashallah, the, um, for madhahib as the core and with the outside and between the four madhahib, if someone to pick a madhab in the last question. Now, regardless picking up a madhab, we see people choosing madhab or not, but like they, they are very firm on, the, on what they know. So what's your advice to these people? I'll give you an example. Like two months ago, someone told me that they cannot come and pray Asr with us because because he's Shafi and we pray on the Hanafi time. So he'd rather to pray at home before we came in the masjid and he came with me, but he prayed at home before he came to the masjid. So that's the extreme that he wouldn't pray at a, at a Hanafi time. And then what is your advice to the organizations and the masajid to do to kind of help people mingle or, or you know, do the right thing from, from that perspective. I'm not talking about someone to choose the right madhab, just like what they should do or what is your advice to them that, that should, how should they practice the ibadah while they believe in madhab or, or they just believe in their sheikh like you said. Jazakallah mm -hmm. khair. We have to value the importance of unity, the importance of harmony, uh, between the Muslims, uh, we have to understand that we live in a different um, sort of environment uh, as minorities in America. We cannot afford to do this anymore. Like the one masjid may have people from, from all the backgrounds. Uh, and like I said, that is why it is preferred for the public not to subscribe to a particular madhab. That's one of the benefits of the public. Because if you're, if you're from Indonesia, for instance, and you travel to Pakistan, you're going to be stuck. You're not going to be finding a lot of Shafi's there to ask. Uh, or vice versa, you know. Um, so, so, so for the public, I, I guess it, it is, uh, it's better not to just subscribe to something that you don't know why you're subscribing to it. Uh, because ignorance and zeal is like mixing uh, oil and fire. Um, so then uh, there are multitudes of examples that we can give and remind people of. So Imam Abu Yusuf, the, the disciple of Imam Abu Hanifa, prayed behind Harun al-Rashid um, after he did hijama or wet cupping. And you know, in, their, in, in Hanafi Madhab, Harun al-Rashid did not have wudu. 
so he did make, made he did hijama and then he did not make wudu and he w proceeded to pray because he asked Malik and Malik advised him that he doesn't need to make wudu. Abu Yusuf prayed behind him. Uh, so Abu Yusuf now is praying behind someone who in his book does not have wudu. Uh, so they approached Imam Abu Yusuf afterwards and they said, you know, how do you pray behind someone who doesn't have wudu? He said, he said that Malik gave him a fatwa. So Imam Malik gave him a fatwa. Do you want, what, what do you want me to do? So that is why the scholars then started to say, if their prayer is correct for them, it's correct for you. It doesn't have to be correct for you to be correct for you. If the Imam's prayer is correct for him, it is correct for you. It's good enough for you. So if someone wipes on the socks, for instance, and that is a Hanbali position, you know, even a Sheikh Ali Jama, uh, uh, he has a, a video on YouTube uh, advising people that this is a true Hanbali position. This is not a made-up position. This is a true Hanbali. Wiping on the socks is the authorized position in the Hanbali method. So, so anyway, uh, the, the, the issue here, if, if someone wipes on the socks, many people would not pray behind them uh, because he doesn't have wudu. Well, for Abu Yusuf, uh, this was even worse, you know. Uh, and he prayed behind the Harun Rashid. If their prayer is good for them, it's good uh, for you. I'll give you another example that may be even closer to, you know, your particular scenario. The other example is when they asked Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, you know, in the Hanbali uh, a school of fiqh or law, just like the Malikis and Shafi'is, the way we pray witr is different from the way Hanafis pray witr. So Hanafis, they have, they sit down in the middle. To us, that is basically prohibited because the Prophet ﷺ said, don't liken witr to Maghrib. To Hanafis, they are not likening Witr to Maghrib because the last raka'ah in Maghrib is silent and they have it jahri in, uh, you know, in Witr. So they say, no, we're not making it like Maghrib. We say, yes, no, you're still making it like Maghrib. So Imam Tamiya was asked if a Hanbali Imam prays for a Hanafi crowd, what should he do? You know, now if he prays his way, they're gonna be upset. If he prays their way, he would be praying a prayer that he believes to be prohibited by the Prophet also. He said that this prayer is disliked, it is not haram, it is disliked. Well, you know, harmony, bringing harmony between the Muslims is mandatory. And uh, praying like this is disliked. And then when there is a conflict, give preference to harmony. So favor harmony. And he advised this Hanabi, Hanbali Imam to pray the Hanafi way, because that would be more sort of comforting to his uh, crowd, to his congregation. Um, and it was already gracious enough of them to have a Hanbali Imam for a Hanafi crowd. So he said, why, why don't you just also compromise? Uh, so that is how things, you know, and, and again, at the same time, it, it depends on your worldview and it depends on your perspective, it depends on your attitude and, and so on. And we can have these discussions all the time, but at the end of the day, if we're really interested in harmony and if we're really interested in unity, we have these positions, scholarly positions that we can use. We have other scholarly positions that we can use. The choice is ours. Yes. Jazakallah khair. A brother is asking you, when are you going to visit them in Minnesota? And the other brother is asking, how can a lay person find or choose a trusted scholar to follow, especially here in the West? And I'm going to pass the mic to the sisters. Okay. So, <clears throat> so Minnesota. Aren't they having, uh, the, I, I guess, 
you know, I can come whenever they want me in Minnesota. I'm, you know, they are my people. I lived in Minnesota for 10 years. So, yes, whenever they want me back, I, I must go back. Uh, anyway, uh, the question about the, the, the scholar. Like I said, so here is the issue. People will tell you if you come to the scholar, all the confusion will go away, and it'll be good, and you'll be well, and that's it. That's begging the question, because how do you know that the scholar is good before you know what good is, is to begin with? يعرف الحق بالرجال ولا يعرف الرجال يعرف الرجال بالحق ولا يعرف الحق بالرجال. So we have to know what is good first to know what what a, what a good man is, uh, not vice versa. Therefore, you need to diversify your port your exposure, diversify your exposure initially diversify exposure, and then learn more, and as you learn, you will develop, use your instinct that Allah had given you to figure out who's a good man, who upholds their preaching, who walks the talk, because that's important, follow someone who walks the talk, and then follow someone, you know, you're also learning, you're also learning, and you can tell from your learning who is uh, walking the talk is sincere. What is the other condition? Correct, adhering to the Sunnah of the Prophet So these are the two conditions. So you're looking for someone who's walking the talk and again at the same time he's preaching things that seem to be adherent to the way of the Prophet and the way of his of the first generation. You know, and they, they have a lot of emphasis on first lady and first uh, dog. And <laughs> the first is, is important. The first is important. But, you know, the most important first for us is called the first generation. This is the school of the Prophet ﷺ. These are the people who directly learned from the Prophet ﷺ and they had the knowledge, they had the sincerity, and they had the tazkiyah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the best of generations. So uh, do this. And again, at the same time, you will eventually, you will eventually see that they will disagree. And you may be inclined to, to a particular type of scholars over another type of scholars. When you become more inclined to a particular type of scholars over another type of scholars, make sure that you don't cut off your connection to the other less favorable type because they will have goodness and they will have haq that you will miss out on if you basically uh, burn the bridges with them. So continue to diversify your exposure. But then you will develop some leanings. Over time, you'll develop some leanings while you're developing the leanings, and after you develop the, develop the leanings, continue to diversify your exposure. Sisters? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for the lecture. You gave a dua of the Prophet Salah Salah earlier. We all, I only caught a little bit of it. He said, O oh Allah, Lord of the angels, and you mentioned the angels, creator of the heaven and earth, you know, of the unseen and seen. And that's all I got. Could he give us the rest, please? Okay, you judge between your servants in that over which they dispute. You judge between your servants in that over which they dispute, or regarding that over which they dispute. Guide me to the truth concerning that over which they disputed. By your permission, you guide whomever you please to a straight path. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Um, I had another question for you. Um, 
going back on the previous answer that you gave. So when you talk about leanings, um, and there might be, and I'm guessing that each person might lean slightly in a different way. Mm -hmm. If you are, um, you know, responsible for a masjid as in a board member or something of that nature, whose leanings do you, I, I don't want to say follow, but whose leanings do you um, offer the services for in the masjid or uh, when you're picking the religious authority for the masjid? Are you going with the leanings of the board members? Are you going with the leanings of the community? Are you going with a mix of the both? Um, I would appreciate any guidance. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so you want to burn my hands now. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, um, since you asked, I'll have to answer. <laughs> uh, you can be can't. I mean, oh, you, know, yeah. you don't have to be very open if you don't want to. <laughs> no, I'll, you know, I, I'll just say whatever I believe, I guess. Um, because if you do this, then it doesn't matter what happens. And if you, if you don't, then you always blame yourself. It, the issue here is, at the end of the day, we will have to choose representatives because you can't have all the people agree on the management of any institution all the time. You can't bring all the people all the time to agree on decisions. So we will have to have some kind of representation. So the board eventually will have to be that representation. And it is hoped that it does represent the community because it was selected by the community. So the board that has been selected by the community should represent the community and then they should basically follow their leanings at the same time, I have always advised that Masajid adopt the concept of fraternities and they would allow people of different leanings to use the facility, the premise, for their activities, even if they don't hold them in the name of the masjid. If the board of the masjid believes that, you know, this particular activity is not like in harmony or uh, congruent with the direction of the masjid or the, the vision of the masjid or the leanings of the masjid, allow fraternities to have their own time and allow them to use the premise. Certainly, if they're not doing anything that is completely far off the chart, completely, you know, like something that's just too, too far out there. But, uh, but if, if it is something that's just like a little controversy between Muslims and, and, and so on, then uh, allow them to conduct their activities uh, under the name of their own fraternity. Can you can, can call it Khadija group, for instance, and bring in people to, yeah. Since there's one more. Side. Yes, I have one yes. more question. Um, my question is: We talked about the scientific method um, and also some of Salat Afida. How do we foster and support that in our children, in our families, um, to for like the correct epistemology? Basically, you you always tell them, you know, the source of this information. Where is it coming from? That's a very simple exercise. So, how do we know that this is true? Uh, and if we ask ourselves, how do we know that this is true? It's not gonna be every time because you're not gonna be too, like too morbid and, and paranoid and stuff uh, because that could make life also very unpleasant, uh, but frequently enough so that the idea itself is established in their mind that it's, we just don't believe everything we, we hear, that there has to be a process of investigation to verify that what we have heard, what we have come to know is actually knowledge that's worth knowing, uh, that's true. So just ask them, how do you know that this is uh, true? And then, you know, uh, Muslims also, because we, are, we tend to be a lot of eccentric, minorities tend to be eccentric, don't get offended, that's fine. We tend to have more we tend, to ease, we, we tend to easily believe in the conspiracy theory. So like the, this conspiracy theory is spread among Muslims a little bit easier. That is fine because we are different from the mainstream. You know, we believe that the mainstream 
we, we, we basically subscribe to a different religion. So, and we have sort of different value system and many things uh, from the mainstream, although we share with them because, you know, many of you guys are, are born here, you're Western, so there, there is no problem in being Western and Muslim, but you're always, you know, the, your rock is your religion in terms of the value system, in terms of the belief system, that, that is your anchorage. And, but being Western at the same time is, is fine, and there are a lot of virtues um, in the West that you may adopt, but minorities tend to do that. Minorities, it's, it's easier for conspiracies or conspiracy theories to spread, to spread among uh, minorities. Uh, so we have a lower threshold to accept uh, the notion of a conspiracy, which could be unhealthy, to be honest with you. <laughs> it could be unhealthy and sometimes it could get to the point of insanity. So we just got, got to be careful about that. So we're going to delay the Isha, so we'll pray around 8.15, inshallah. So any more questions? And uh, Sister Aisha is telling me to inform we have snacks uh, in the multipurpose room, inshallah. Um, so after the Aisha and questions, we can go ahead and try to finish it at 8.15. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thanks for your time, Sheikh. Um, uh, one of my hobbies to reach out Muslims that I don't see them in the mosque, or neither I see them practicing. And I encounter that uh, they're suffering from that paranoid to believe if Quran is the truth. In fact, last week, one of the highly educated person. He was a professor at Harvard of my country. And he did his PhD, now he's living in this country, and he sent me a message. You are too religious. So I called him back, and I find him very healthy and mental way, and he's willing to engage conversation. I'm glad to hear from you today that the miracle, the message itself is the proof. Now, my question is, should we engage ourselves discussing with the people who are confused? And I like that confused word from your lecture today from the very beginning. I'll remember for the rest of my life. I need your advice whether we should engage conversation with them or not, or should we refer them to talk to uh, folks like you? Well, it <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. So it, it, it depends, like many, many of them will not want to talk to folks like me or for, you know, folks that are more knowledgeable than me. They may be more interested in a friendly discussion with a friend, then you, you should start the discussion. Uh, and you do your best. And sometimes you could also refer them to good books to read or to good uh, lectures to listen to, uh, which are available, alhamdulillah. And, and advise them, advise them to, uh, to basically, to be sincere, to be serious, to be sincere, to be serious, to not make no haste, and to block off the noise. So, because to judge Islam by what I said in this lecture is wrong, by what X, Y, Z speaker, but what, XYZ speaker says or or um, or or does is wrong. Uh, they need to build their own fortress. They need to build their own faith, uh, one step at a time, and focus on the core, the center, and go out in circles. The, the, you know, seeking the help of Allah and being God conscious and being uh, righteous, pious, kind, uh, and, and just, just good, good. And, and inshallah, Allah will never let them down if they do it this way. And if they do it not for basically uh, 
not, not pretentiously. They just do it for their own salvation, their own survival, their own happiness in this life and the one to come. Because once they start to act uh, like arrogant or once they start to be arrogant, they may be deprived of guidance. And no matter how much effort or how much reading or watching they do, they may be blocked off because of the arrogance. So sincere, serious, uh, in the you know, pursuit of the truth, systematically going from the center outward. You know, so, you know, the religious people are talking about the beard and the, this is not the time to talk about this. This is not the time to, to entertain, you know, the beard or the, the turban or, you know, you don't like the fact that I'm wearing this. It doesn't matter at all. You know, it's my preference. Uh, just like, don't get distracted by it. Uh, f focus on what you need to focus on, the center. Last question, uh, Sheikh. Um, what are the top three ways to obtain Jannah? Being a 42-year-old American Muslim, it's difficult to narrow down my practice. There are so many options and there are so many ways to learn and follow Islam. Okay. So, it is hard because I don't know you. The Prophet ﷺ many times has been approached, uh, uh, what are the best deeds in the sight of Allah? Which is a question that is closer to your question. How do we, what's the shortest route uh, to Allah, to the pleasure of Allah? And the Prophet gave variant answers, they, like a variety of answers. Um, so, so, you know, one time he would talk about kindness when he sees someone who's a little rough. So one time he would talk about al walidain and, you know, prayer. Uh, but there is a, a particular one in Tabarani uh, that is reported from Abdullah ibn Omar. أحب الناس إلى الله أنفعهم للناس. وأحب الأعمال إلى الله سرور تدخله على مؤمن أو تكشف عنه كربة أو تقضي عنه دينة أو تطرد عنه جوعة ولا نمشي مع أخي في حاجة له فأقضيها أحب لي من أن أعتكف في هذا المسجد الشهرة ومن كظم غيظه ومن كظم غيظه so, okay. A translation of this is, this, this was reported by Tabrani from Abdullah ibn Omar and where he said that the, the most beloved people before Allah are those who are more of greatest benefit for the people. The most beloved people before Allah are those of greatest benefit for the people. And the best deeds before Allah or in the sight of Allah are uh, bringing joy to the heart of a believer uh, or paying off his debt, uh, removing his hunger, uh, relieving his distress. Um, and it is better for me to walk with a, a brother of mine to procure some of his needs than to make atikaf in this masjid of mine for a month. And whoever suppresses his anger while capable of releasing it, Allah will fill his heart with hope on the day of resurrection. Uh, it's, it is a beautiful hadith, and many of us can benefit from this hadith because many of us, because of the way we, we live far away from the masajid and we, most of us live in like, not all of us, but many of us live in townhouses or like suburban areas where, you know, your next neighbor is like far away from you and you rarely see people and you're all the time on your iPhone or uh, whatever else that you guys have. Uh, iPhone is better. <laughs> <laughs> 
But anyway, that's fine. Uh, but so, so that connection with people, that that concept of service, that concept of relieving someone's distress, coming to the masjid and seeing someone, you know, quiet and and sad and sitting next to them to talk to them, just simply giving someone like your ears to, to listen to their complaint or to listen to their um, suffering. Many people need just someone to listen to them and not say anything, but just someone out there to listen to them. That's an act of charity. And there are so many of those acts of charity to, 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 to have this emotional and psychological surplus and spend from it. You know, it, it is a spiritual strength. You develop the surplus uh, emotionally and and spiritually and psychologically, and you spend from it. You you pass on to like coworkers, to neighbors, to uh, members of your household, and 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 so on and so forth. Um, these people are the most beloved people in the sight of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and. Also to reach out, like, you know, you have activities like to relieve, relieve people's hunger. You know, there is this uh, group of people in, in New York, what's their name? Muslims Giving Back. Uh, you know, where I was in Minnesota, we, we started an initiative. Uh, you know, some friends of mine and I, we started an initiative called the Building Blocks of Islam. They may be here in us now. Uh, where, you know, it's, it's, it's a group of people that came together and felt that they wanted to do something good. And mashallah, they, they, it's been a great initiative and they continue to do a lot of good work. Um, so like four or five of you can start a big, a, a big project, you know, start it small, but then it will grow exponentially if you put your heart into it and you trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do serve you know, humanity, Allah's creations, ayal Allah, Allah's dependence. Uh, these things will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is a very short and sweet route to his pleasure. Jazakumullah khair, Sheikh. Jazakumullah khair for coming up for your time. Thank you very much. And Jazakumullah khair, brothers and sisters, for being here. And we're looking forward for more of these events, inshallah.